uh, and build their professional networks. Um, there are certainly benefits to faculty who extend the invitation. We talk a lot, especially to junior faculty, about how they should be inviting um, you know, potential letter writers or people who are editors or journals. But those invitations will also have positive externalities to the speaker and to graduate students in the audience uh, through potential role model effects, for example. And so what I'm worried about and my co-authors are worried about is this could lead to an inefficient allocation of seminar invites. Um, and so as we talk about you know, the, the lack of diversity in economics as a profession, we worry that the current gender and racial disparities in economics might be exacerbated by the disparities in who's invited to give seminar talk. So I've had lots of conversations with, um, with colleagues and, and fellow economists about this over the years, and there are lots of empirical questions here, and we really didn't have any data to let us uh, really see what was going on on the ground. And so, so we started collecting the data. Um, and so in this paper, we provide descriptive evidence on who gives invited seminar talks in economics based on an extensive ongoing data collection effort. So uh, first, of course, we had to develop a list of the economics departments and econ adjacent departments. Uh, we pulled that from a variety of sources. That includes departments in the US as well as departments abroad. Um, and then starting in January 2019, we, uh, we've been pulling the information on seminar schedules directly from department websites. Many, but not all departments post archives of their previous schedules. And so we've taken advantage of that. Um, so the current paper, what I'm going to show you today, is using a balanced panel of 66 departments. Those are the panels that had data available from August 2014 through December 2019. We've looked at this a bunch of different ways and using different lengths of panels. And the numbers from these departments that I'm going to show you um, are very similar to those from de other departments in later years. So you can think of this as being pretty representative of the full sample. For some of what I show you, we're also going to use uh, repick rankings of the um, of the departments to kind of give a sense of kind of what tier of department uh, people are giving talks in or people are coming from. Um, those rankings we pulled um, in August 2019. At the time, they went from one to 298, uh, with many departments unranked. So we'll show you those in, in various buckets. Um, and then within any university, any econ adjacent departments would get the econ departments ranking. So Chicago Booth, for instance, would get Chicago Econs ranking um, in, in our analysis. So here are the characteristics of the departments in our sample. Uh, as I said, we have 66 departments. We really tried to get a, a, a real mix of departments here. Um, and so 34 of those have a PhD program. The rest do not. Um, there are, on average, about nine or 10 external speakers per semester in these departments. Um, the locations, about 90% of our, our departments are in the US. Currently in this sample, 10% are outside the US. Um, uh, about 24% are, are in the Northeast, 12% in the Midwest, 32% uh, in the South, and 21% in the West. Um, and then in terms of the tier of, uh, of the department, um, about 6% uh, are in the top 10, um, and about 8% each are in going from 11 to 25, 26 to 50. Um, and, and you can see the other numbers there. About 36% of the departments in our sample are, are unranked, so below the 298 that REPEC ranked. Um, and so again, we really just tried to get a, a good mix of departments to get a sense of what was going on everywhere. A big part of this project has been coding the demographics of the speakers. Um, and so we code two things. We code gender, so whether the speaker is male or female. We also code underrepresented minority status or URN status in two ways based on a bunch of conversations about what the right way to do this is. Uh, I, I think there's probably no right way. <laughs> so we code it in two ways. Um, the first we're gonna call URM US and that is if you are black, uh, Latino or Native American and grew up in the US. Um, we also code a broader definition of URM international. So that would include anyone who's black and grew up anywhere a Latinx and grew up in the US or in Latin America or Native American and grew up in the US. Um, in practice, the additional people that that definition brings in tend to be white scholars from Argentina and Brazil. So you should have those are basically the additional, um, the additional folks in those groups. Um, but of course, there are some black scholars, for instance, who just grew up outside the US. Um, so, you know, we took our best guess uh, on these demographics based on the publicly available information, mostly from people's websites, uh, like their name, their photo, their citizenship when they listed it on their CV, and the location of their undergraduate institution. 
that was particularly what we used to distinguish um, the US and international URM status. Uh, we fully acknowledge that this is imperfect. Um, and I think the best way to interpret our coding of demographic groups is how the person's perceived by others. Uh, we restricted our sample in a few ways. So our sample of talks and speakers is only going to include economists. So those with econ or econ adjacent PhDs or who are affiliated with an econ department. Um, we include only PhD level scholars. So we exclude grad students. You have to have a PhD at the time of the talk. Uh, and we only include external speakers. So we don't include you know, internal brown bags or if you invite someone from a different department on campus, you have to be a scholar from a different institution that's visiting. All right, so here are our characteristics of seminar talks and speakers. There, there are two different ways to break this down. So we might be interested in the composition of all the talks. So that's the seminars column. We might alternatively be interested in the composition of the speakers. So each individual speaker could give multiple talks. On average in our sample, each speaker gives two talks, around two talks, which I'll talk more about um, in a bit. Um, so we've got these two separate columns. We can either look at the composition of the, the um, people who give the seminar talks, or we could give a look at the demographics of the individual unique speakers. Um, it turns out for most of what we're looking at, it, it's pretty similar <laughs> across the two, uh, the two columns. I think we expected there to be more of a difference. About 22 or 23% um, of the talks are given by non-URM women, 76% are given by non-URM men, and then a, a measly about 0.5% are given by URM women and 0.6% are given by URM men. Um, uh, that will be a running theme in this talk, it's just how low those numbers are. Uh, we can break this, the talks up by, um, the, by seniority. So we can look at junior scholars, those who are less than six years from their PhD, about 30% of talks are given by junior scholars. Another quarter of the talks are given by mid-career scholars, those six to 11 years from their PhD. And about 44, 45% of, of talks are given by um, senior scholars, those 12 years plus. So those would be the potential letter writers and the editors and so on. Um, the one place we do see a bit of a difference is when we look at the REPEC ranking of the speaker affiliation. Um, so uh, in, we look at the seminar column, it looks like about 20% of talks are each are given by um, speakers in the top 10 or, or um, those from uh, departments in the 11 to 25 bucket. Those are the scholars that are giving most of the talks. Um, and so uh, we see that um, when we look at the unique speakers, about 16% um, uh, of the unique speakers are each in each of those buckets. Um, but otherwise it doesn't make a huge difference, which whether we look at seminar, the seminar level or speaker level. Um, in this, on this one slide, I'm also gonna show you the numbers for URM international speakers. For most of the talk, I'm gonna use the URM US numbers. Um, but this shows you, you know, when we do use a broader definition of URM, we get slightly higher numbers in those buckets. Again, most of these additional people are white men from uh, from Brazil and, and Argentina, so uh, from Latin America. So just have that in mind when you think about kind of the additional um, uh, URM speakers that we get when we use that definition. It may or may not be what you have in mind. All right, so it's a question I get a lot when I talk about this is how many uh, talks on average uh, each speaker gives. There's a sense out there that there are a few superstars that are giving all the talks. Um, and so this, this slide is kind of giving you the descriptives on that. So on the y-axis, we see the number of speakers in each bucket. And on the x-axis is the, um, the number of talks that they're giving. And so you can see in each of the, this, and then so the, the top left is non-URM women, top right is non-URM men, bottom left URM women, bottom right URM men. Um, I think so, you know, one big takeaway from each of these is that most people in our sample are just giving one talk. Um, so you, in order to get into our sample, you have to have given a talk and so we don't see the zeros here um, but then conditional on giving one talk most people are just giving the one talk um, at least within our sample of departments um, but then there are you know there are people who give 10 talks or so over the, the five and a half year um, sample but um, but uh, I think you know most of the mass is, is down here for sure um, let's see Another uh, thing we can look at is just trends in, in these seminar compositions over time. So the uh, solid lines here are the mean um, share of departmental talks by each group 
um, in a given semester. So the top left is the share of departmental talks by non-URM women. Uh, you can see that hovers you know, just under 25% for most of the period. There does seem to be an uptick in 2019, both the, the spring and the fall. So we'll see if that continues. But then the dotted line is the median. And so you can see that um, for women, the median is, is a bit below the mean. Uh, this suggests something that we'll dig into more on the next slide that you know, there are a few departments that are sort of punching above their weight um, in terms of uh, inviting um, many more than the average number of women to give talks and that's dragging the mean up, but most departments are giving fewer talks, are inviting fewer women than that. For the non-URM men, the top right, uh, we see again, it's pretty flat for most of the period. It starts declining a little bit in 2017. Um, and they are consistently the median is above the mean. So we've got, you know, some departments that are inviting far fewer non-URM men, but most are inviting um, a more homogenous group than that. The bottom two um, graphs are showing URM men, women on the left and URM men on the right. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, the main takeaway here is, you know, it's pretty flat and low until the mean is pretty flat and low around, you know, half a percent of the speakers or the talks um, are given by URM men and URM women um, until there's this big spike in, in 2018, goes right back down for the women, um, stays elevated a little bit for the men. We'll see if that continues. But the other really striking feature of both of these graphs is the median is a flat zero um, in every semester. So most departments in any given semester are inviting zero URM women to speak and zero URM men. Um, as those medians uh, and means suggested that those averages mask substantial heterogeneity across departments. So this is showing you um, the number of departments on the y-axis and the x-axis is the share of speakers um, that they are inviting from each group. So you can see in the, in the top left, there is one department that never invited a single non-URM woman to speak over the five and a half years. Um, in general, the means about 0.23, there are a lot of departments that are below that, but some up at about half of their speakers are women. Um, and so, so those, are the, those are the departments that are dragging the average up. Um, basically the reverse is, is, uh, is visible in the non-URM male speaker graph. Um, and then on for the bottom graphs, the URM women and the URM men, you know, the most striking feature here is that, you know, in most departments, as the median suggested before, the, the, the departments are, are not inviting any uh, speakers from these groups. Um, so we had 66 departments and we see that for over 40 departments um, are inviting zero um, URM women and URM men to speak in any over the full period. Um, I also get a lot of questions about how this varies across different seminar series. Um, so obviously some fields are more diverse than others. There's more of a pool of, of, um, of women and URM scholars to invite in the first place. So we can break it up. Um, we kind of, you know, <laughs> different departments have different names for all their seminar series. There's a, you know, they're kind of combined in different ways. So we kind of did the best we could to standardize those across different uh, departments. Uh, and this is the list we come up with. The department um, uh, observation is, you know, those are for smaller departments that only have one seminar series. They don't break them out by topic. So um, that's kind of going to be close to the average. And then for the, so the other, the other departments have um, different uh, seminar series by field. We can see for the non-URM speakers, basically the, um, the red box is showing the smallest share. The green box is showing the, the highest share. So the, the um, seminar series with the most non-URM women is development. Uh, they also correspondingly have the least uh, non-URM men. And then the, the uh, seminar series with the most non-URM men is micro theory and they have the fewest non-URM women. Uh, for URM speakers, there are a whole lot of zeros. <laughs> this is um, also just a function of, again, there, as you'll see in a, uh, in a bit, there are just so few talks here that when we get into some of these fields, it's just, um, it's, I guess, not surprising that there are zero talks, but still striking and, and concerning. So there are a number of different fields here where you would just never see a URM scholar come through the seminar series in any department in, say, IO, international trade, agriculture, environmental, uh, and so on. We do see, you know, there are more speakers in econometrics for URM men. It's basically, I think, one person. Um, and for URM women, they're more in the business seminars, which are mostly finance. Um, we can also break the look at this, the composition of talks given by each group by host ranking. So this is breaking the, the, the host departments up into these repec buckets. Um, so the top left is the top 10 departments. And then we look at the, the um, 
Uh, top right is 11 to 25, 26 to 50, 51 to 100. And the bottom ones are um, 101 to the full 298. So that's the rest of the rank, the rank departments. And then we have the unranked departments. Um, I think you know the biggest takeaway for me from these graphs is just how similar they all look. Uh, I think people who ask about this expect there to be a lot of variation across these different buckets. Um, there really isn't. Basically, it looks pretty flat. <laughs> um, the trends across the different across the different um, all years in these different buckets, and um, and the same share of of talks being given by non urm men and uh, non urm women. And the URM male and female groups are, are basically indistinguishable or invisible here. So the gray, again, if it's not, if you can't see the little legend at the bottom, the gray area is the non-URM men, pink is non-URM women, blue, which you can barely see, is URM men, and yellow, which you can also barely see, is URM women. Um, another you know, way we could look at that is to, to break the um, the, or kind of look at both the, the intersection of the host department ranking and the speaker affiliation ranking. So one thing we can do is to say, well, where, where are the talks that each group is giving? And so the, the headers are along the top are showing um, uh, each demographic group and the total number of talks they give in our, in our five and a half year sample. So um, of the you know 1600 talks that non urine women are giving, about 31% are in top 25 departments, 18% are at the bottom, the unranked departments. Um, for non-URM men, it's very similar, um, which I think, and I don't know what I expected going in, but there's basically no difference across those groups. Um, looking at uh, the URM women and URM men, again, you just see there's so few talks that these are these estimates are probably going to be quite noisy, but um, but we do see that um, a much a smaller share of the talks are given at top 25 departments. Um, and a slightly higher share given at the, the, the bottom um, departments, especially for the URM men. And then we can say, well, within the talks at the top 25, who's being invited, right? Where are the speakers coming from? And so there, um, again, we see pretty similar numbers. I think I actually highlighted that in the next slide. Um, we see similar, pretty similar numbers um, for the, the non-URM men and women. About 60% of the talks that they give at the top 25 departments are by speakers from those departments, from the top 25 departments, and about you know, nine to 11% are coming from the bottom. Um, the numbers uh, for URM women and URM men, uh, the vast majority, <clears throat> excuse me, about 90% of the, the, um, the talks at the top 25 departments are by speakers from those departments. So essentially no one from other tiers <laughs> is getting a chance to, um, to talk in those departments, which I think is important to, um, to think about. All right, so, um, you know, the next, the next thing people, uh, I think, have in mind is just like, what's the... Um, so Jen, what, we're at time. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I was trying to pay attention to the chat, but missed it. Um, uh, let me just wrap up with just saying, you know, I think the main, the main thing I'll leave everyone with is that um, we shouldn't necessarily be targeting the, tar the current composition of the profession, but what we aspire for that composition to be. Um, I think there are a variety of ways in which we could, um, you know, shift the the share of speakers and um, and have and see improvements on other metrics as well. So we'll be working on this a lot more going forward, and look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Jen. Thanks so much. Um, the discussant is Pat Bayer. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. That's, uh, thanks. I want to thank uh, Heather for inviting me to be part of this great session and uh, you know, for being able to discuss this, this really important paper by uh, Jen, Aaron, and Elizabeth. Uh, it's really more of, a more of a major project than a paper. I mean, I think the pa it's a paper, but it also uh, has a lot more uh, to go still. So uh, I wanted to start my, my brief comments by just backing up a little bit and discussing why uh, understanding seminar invitations and the seminar ecosystem in economics is so important. And I think, you know, the, the way I start to think about it is just the organization of our discipline as a whole. You know, we know that ideas flow uh, through a network of scholars and, you know, ideas and, and papers are legitimized and shared and popularized by others in that network. Uh, and so a, a natural hierarchy results uh, where some people are very important or influential within that network. You can think about referees, journal editors, those with large audiences for their own papers, opinions, and ideas. And, and therefore, there's enormous benefits from the attention and positive 
judgment of those who are influential within the hierarchy. So that's kind of the context uh, of, of, the, of the discipline. Uh, we know that this kind of hierarchical network structure uh, for ideas naturally creates a lot of positive reinforcing feedback loops. So uh, even if we start with the notion that there's some level of objective differentiation, you know, ideas and papers can be creative or insightful or novel. Uh, individuals can write a number of those kinds of papers or contribute ideas to others. Uh, the incentives created in this kind of structure, in this kind of network structure, provide uh, additional power and benefits to those who are, you know, well situated within the hierarchy. Uh, and there's also a sense that there's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy here that sometimes initial opportunities are granted and in part based on promise or expectations of success within this kind of network. And then those within the higher within a higher position are given more opportunities, more resources, treated better in many ways, and that serves to kind of reinforce the network itself. Uh, and this works not only for people but ideas in the sense that you know ideas that are put forth by those who are powerful within the hierarchy are more more easily shared, more easily seen as legitimate. Others appeal to those ideas, uh, the authority of those ideas, and follow and copy them and demand that others do so. And and certain topics are perceived as important by the majority within kind of a discipline. Uh, and then they're elevated, they're, they're, the importance of those topics are elevated in the hierarchy, while others are relegated to the margins. Uh, and so that this kind of hierarchical structure then naturally reinforces biases that uh, pre-existing biases, uh, it tends to amplify those. Uh, so, you know, we see this very strongly when it comes to gender and race and economics, uh, any underlying bias uh, uh, that affects somebody standing within the hierarchy is then amplified by the incentives to engage in these kind of network or hierarchical games. Uh, but even more insidiously, if there's a perception that economics is biased against certain groups or people from certain groups, uh, then those people will be viewed as less influential uh, and, and within the hierarchy and in turn less valuable contacts. And so there's a concern that a lot of this kind of self-reinforcing aspect of the hierarchy itself uh, tends to even, even more strongly reinforce biases especially for groups that are really uh, severely underrepresented in economics. Uh, so, that, so where do seminar invitations come in? Uh, basically seminar invitations you know, provide a direct chance to talk about ideas and get feedback, uh, to learn about new things that, that are going on in the profession. But they also, as Jen said, they also provide a chance to meet people, get, to, get them to know who you are, who you, what you're working on. Uh, in this kind of game of attention, these meetings and presentations provide an enormous opportunity uh, for focused attention of, of key people in the profession. And this flows in both directions. So it's both when you give a talk, but also when you're inviting people. And that's what creates a lot of the powerful incentives to invite people well positioned in the hierarchy. And again, there's multiple levels at play here. So seminar invitations uh, provide opportunities for the direct exchange of ideas, which is, so you wanna invite people who are gonna be really helpful there, but they also provide an opportunity to engage in these kind of network and hierarchy problems. Uh, and so they're really important. So when it comes to the empirical study of this, we really know very little about this before the work of uh, Jen, uh, Aaron, and Elizabeth. And I think there's kind of four very natural questions. Uh, the first is what, uh, what the authors have done in the paper here today, which is just to ask the question of who gets these opportunities. We know these opportunities are valuable regardless of the motivation for them. Uh, and so the natural first question is to ask is who gets them and who doesn't. Uh, what factors explain these differences, this enormous data collection effort and the kind of first wave of, of results here by Jen and and Elizabeth provide a set of answers to those. You know, I think, you know, relative to what's been presented, I think I'd be really interested in also seeing how important things are in kind of that early career development. You know, what kinds of opportunities are available to people and, and it's, it's there in the summary statistics, but not really in the kind of what kind of, uh, you know, how, the, how that progresses throughout the career. The second kind of question, and this was on the last, Jen's last slide that she didn't quite get to, which is, you know, what are the consequences of these types of invitations? So, you know, trying to isolate a random component in these, in, in these invitations and then using that to trace the impact on, on folks' scholarly careers will be a really important next step of this research agenda. You know, I think a third question that I think is really critical is that kind of really difficult to answer though is, is you know, to what extent are these opportunities kind of quote unquote earned or simply grant it based on network or position. And so here, I, you know, what I have in mind is like, if someone, if you could regress opportunities, seminar invites, you know, on some kind of notion of direct value added plus network and position, how much would load on that kind of network position as a kind of what's driving the seminar invitations. And then finally, just running throughout all of this, uh, you know, in many ways is how does the structure and the ecosystem of our seminar system and economics contribute 
to compound gender and racial inequalities. And again, we're seeing answers here uh, to the first question of who gets these opportunities, but I think kind of also trying to understand what's driving those, you know, those kind of differential opportunities and how much of it is driven by that kind of the nature of the hierarchy itself, uh, I think will be, you know, kind of a, a, you know, really important to learn as we, as the authors continue on this research agenda. So just to wrap up, you know, overall, this is an, an incredibly ambitious project and, you know, it's already giving us lots of information that's really valuable and I expect a lot of great things to come. Great, thanks so much. Um, we'll move on to the next paper and then um, the, uh, the authors can type uh, into the Q&A if they want to and then we'll address some live uh, at the end of the session. So the next paper is by Marlon Kofi and it's Innovative Ideas and Gender Inequality. Marlon. Thank you. I'm just trying to share my screen. There you go, it's starting. Okay, so thank you very much. So today, as Judith say, I will present uh, in my paper, which is about innovative idea and gender inequality. And I will start with the motivation. So there are a lot of gender related issues in uh, education and labor. Uh, such as the wage gap, the school difference in terms of school attendance, underrepresentation of women in math intensive skills. And a couple ex of explanations have been given to explain those facts. Uh, for example, difference in terms of family commitment, uh, risk aversion, competitiveness, and also some discriminatory factors. But uh, so far, less is known in terms of the recognition of women's ideas. And meanwhile, uh, academic research offer an idea framework for analyzing how uh, women ideas are perceived, used, and referred to. And we can analyze, uh, to say, ideas in, in a general framework. And focusing especially on economics, there, is, there are some evidence of uh, gender type discrimination in economics. And uh, such di discrimination tend to be even more prevalent in economics if uh, we, we focus on um, previous literature of Bayer, Rawls, Dinton, Kahn also Sasson and Wu. So basically what I'm doing in this paper is to answer to the following question. Is the credit given to women's work and uh, or are women facing any bias in the recognition of their work? And if so, what are the effects and how can we solve this bias? Uh, the paper, uh, so I'm answering to those questions and uh, how I am answering to this, I will use citation or omission from reference. So basically just imagine that you want to write a paper and in writing your paper, there is a bunch of other paper that are related to yours. So let's say we have like 200 papers that are related and you have to, you will have to make a choice basically. And in choosing those uh, paper in the selection, we may have some bias and why not uh, a gender bias? By contrast, imagine that you have like an algorithm that enables you each time you want to write the paper, you just put the keyword or, or some some aspect of the, the abstract and you find like the closest paper to yours. So by construction of such an algorithm, there is no inherent gender bias. And after I will say what I mean by no inherent gender bias. So what happened when we contrast like the author choice and uh, the algorithm choice? So that's what I'm doing in this paper. So uh, the contribution is twofold. Uh, uh, the first part is on the topic. So I shed new light on the lack of recognition of women's work. I present some heterogeneous patterns and uh, also propose some avenue from improvement. The second part is in terms of the methodology. So I use deep learning techniques for public policy. I build a distance and, and according to this distance, I can link the citing paper, the citing paper and the paper that should be cited. I construct also two other indexes and uh, among which the omission index is really peculiar to this paper. So for the finding today, I will focus just on the two first bullet points and left other because of the time. So the first part gives the key result. This is the 2020 pattern where I found that um, omitted paper tend to be 20 more likely to be female author than male author. And I provide some evidence like conditional on the gender of the citing paper. So having male on the citing paper tend to increase omission for female by up to six percentage points. And uh, to have like the second part of the 2020, to have the same level of citation are paper written by male, paper written by women need to be 20 percentile upper in terms of the innovativeness distribution. So the innovativeness uh, index here is an index that I constructed to me, this is a, a way, I would say, to measure the quality of the paper. 
So the second part uh, of the result that I will show today is something to, to complement the 2020. So I show that females are more likely to be cited outside economics and less likely to be cited by top tier journal and also by men. So I will show all those results in detail after. So the overview, I just presented this data description after I will show how I construct the different index and we will move on to the empirical strategy. So for the data, I use data from Web of Science, Econlit, and also Repec. I focus in the baseline on a set of uh, 60, 60 journals that appear to be in all major 20 rankings. Uh, in the baseline, I will have like 24,000 paper uh, from 1991 to 2019. And this will exclude like paper without abstract with, uh, and reference, proceeding, comment, book review, and also biographical item. So why I'm doing all those selections? This is because um, first I want to focus on published paper and on top journal because this is a signal of quality. So this will reduce uh, possible other reasons why uh, people are not citing each other. And uh, the second part is also focuses on published paper because of the reviewing process and the high standard and some potential correction. I anticipate that if there is a paper that is important, that is missing by the author, maybe during this process, this, uh, this will be corrected by the referee and uh, all the editorial board. And finally, I just want to focus on full length article to have like a full length set of reference also. So this is a snapshot of uh, the data that I extracted on Web of Science. So you can see we have the title, the author, the journal, the year, the abstract, the keyword, the institution, and also the reference. And this part is very important because I exploit the full uh, set of reference in the database. Moving on, um, I, I have to infer like the gender composition of the paper based on the gender of the author. So basically I use like a, a building algorithm that is the genderized IO and I build my own algorithm also uh, for type of mistake and so on. And at the end, I have to manual check like for the name that uh, we can, uh, the algorithm that did not give uh, the gender structure with a high precision, I have to manual check all of this. And finally, from the gender of the author, I can infer the gender of the paper. So this is very simple if we have only men this will be a male paper, only female, this will be a female paper. And if we have at least one male and at least one female, this will be a mixed gender and uh, so on. So subsequently, we can distinguish between different types depending on the type of analysis that we want to do. So in the database, I have basically 74% of the paper that are written by men and 5% uh, of the paper that are written by females. And the between is mixed gender paper or paper for which I cannot identify one of the authors. So that's, those are the descriptive uh, for the database from the part of the gender. So now I will show how I construct the omission index uh, based on the similarity. So the intuition of the similarity is based on the, we, we just compare textual uh, similarity based on the topical content of each paper. So we compare each pair of paper. So each paper in the database will be compared to other paper in the database. So just imagine that you have two paper, one talking about apple, the other one talking about orange. And if you can have a vector representation of those two paper, the distance between those two paper will be the angle that we have between the, the two vectors. And based on the, the cosine similarity, I can establish a link. So if I, I, I rank all the cosine, I can establish a link between the citing paper, the paper that cite, and the paper that should be cited. And this is really the basis for construction of the omission index. So I will have a concrete example. So we have the abstract, that's the raw data. After some data cleaning, uh, we can, uh, have the full text as a set of words. And that's what is presented here. Here I have three papers, paper P, P prime, and P second. So we have a set of words, and for each word, we have the number of times that, uh, that, that this word is presented in the paper. After that, we, are, we can construct two different metrics. The first one is the time frequency. So this is the number of times that a given word appears in the given paper relative to the whole, uh, the whole set of words in, in this paper. The second part is the inverse document frequency, and this is the number of paper in which we have a certain word divided by the total number of words. And the product will give us the TFIDF. 
So basically, this is to adjust for the uh, how prominent this word is in the full, text, full set of, of papers. So for each word, we will construct the TF-IDF. So here, as you can see, and this is a kind of weight. So imagine that you have a vector of words and uh, the TF-IDF for a given word in a given paper will give you the weight of this word in this, in this paper. And finally, the cosine will be the dot product. So here, the numerator, this is basically the dot product. So for example, we have like trade credit in paper P times uh, TF-IDF trade credit in paper P prime plus TF-IDF uh, retailer P uh, times retailer P prime and so on. And we normalize the, 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 the two different vectors using the norm two. So this will be the cosine. So moving on to the omission index. So having this pairwise cosine similarity, I can sort and have like the paper I say that are most similar and construct a kind of most similar set. So basically the omission index will take one if a paper P does not cite P, P1, conditional on P1 being in the most similar set and zero or the other ones. And if I come back to the example that I, I have been uh, working on so far, so here we can see that P, P prime and P second are really uh, similar. And as a matter of fact, P prime and P second have, uh, belong to the most similar set. But what is happening is that P have cited P second, but not P prime. So basically the omission index between P and P prime will be one, and the omission index between P and P second will be zero. And uh, P prime is a female author paper, P second is a male author paper, and actually, if the three of them are in the same journal code, P have cited had a male paper before and after P prime that that was published before and after P prime, and those are the kind of things that I'm capturing in the data. So, moving forward, I construct also the innovativeness index. As I say, this is another way to capture like the the quality of the paper, and uh, yeah, this is basically the ratio of two different metrics based on the cosine. The, the denominator will capture how novel is a paper, and the numerator will capture how influential this paper is. So that's that's the, the intuition. So for the empirical strategy, my dependent the, the benchmark model. This is a benchmark probability model. And uh, in some estimation, I will use the logic. In other one, I will use like a linear probability model. And the dependent variable is the omission index between two papers. The independent variable of interest will be the gender, and the coefficient will be of interest will be beta zero. And I control for a wide uh, set of uh, control variables that include like field, institution, uh, number of author, number of reference, affiliation, uh, gender structure of the author, difference in the timing between two papers, and so on. So the key result, I would say, so is this one, is given by this table. So as you can see here, unconditional, uh, non depending on any control, we have that uh, the order of omission for female is 20% higher compared to the order of omission for male. And even after controlling for all the other variables that I mentioned so far, we still have a 30% higher hold for female. And this is significant at 1% level. And uh, Okay, going, going again, uh, I have like a, a two-sided gender effect, like how the omission depends on the gender of the citing paper, of the citing author. So basically what we see here is that having male in the citing author tend to increase the omission for female by up to four percentage points. And by contrast, having female in the citing author uh, tend to reduce omission for female by around seven percentage points. So we see that depending on who is in the citing uh, paper, we tend to have a difference between the omission pattern of female. And this is quite uh, persistent across different type of uh, alternative specification, if I decompose by journal or by institution. And here we can see that even female publishing in top journal, so the top five, are not exempted from this type of discrepancy between uh, that uh, come from the gender of the citing. So I have had a decomposition by field and uh, and so on, but I uh, I will be happy to answer after if there is any question about that in the chat. Okay, so I will present uh, after this two other results. So the first one is the second part of the 20. So as I said, so far I have shown that um, 
Citation could be biased because this could be depend on the gender of the citing and, and other factors, and especially because there is a high level of omission for female. And here I construct a measure of, um, of quality of the paper that does not depend on the willingness of the author to cite another, uh, another paper. And I see the link between this new index and the citation that, that is the common, commonly used index, basically. So what we have here is that we have the two curves. So we have the, the increasing trend, and that's good because uh, the two index are capturing the same thing, so they, they should be in line. But what is striking is the difference between the curve of male and the curve of female. So basically, to have the same level of citation as paper written by male, paper written by female needs to be 20 percentile upper in terms of the innovative male distribution. So we still have this huge gap. And uh, in a counterfactual analysis, when I, I, I compensate citation with the omission, we see that this gap vanishes away. So omission really uh, create a, a discrepancy between citation of male and citation of female. The second part that I would like to show today is um, this exercise. So basically what I'm looking at here is who cites female actually? That's what I, I am trying to, to examine here. So there is uh, there are recent evidence that female tend to have a positive citation premium. So this has been shown by Card and others, and also Engel and Moon, 2020. So the question that I'm asking, it's important to have the global level of citation, but it's also important to have like the decomposition of citation because this will give an idea of who is citing paper and how um, yes how how female people are recognized basically in the field. So in this exercise, I focus only on the top five and uh, I web scrap like for each article, I web scrap the, the different citing paper. So each paper citing a top, a, a top journal, a top five journal, a top five article actually. So I can identify for those paper, the journal and the discipline and also the gender of the citing papers author. So basically I have like 7,000, around 7,000 article 800,000 citing articles that come from 20,000 scientific journals. And in the sample, I have 8% of female, female authors. So uh, having this um, granular database, this will enable me to decompose the citation by different, uh, taking into account different subsample. So for example, I can consider only the citation by male and estimate the gender citation premium. So that's the exercise that I will be doing here. So for the gender citation premium, uh, I decompose depending on the rank on the journal. So here, what you can see is that as the, we, we move to the top percentile, so the top rank journal, we see a decreasing trend in terms of the citation premium. So meaning that uh, as we go, we, we move forward to the top journal, female tend to be less cited compared to men, even controlling for the field, because here I use the three digit uh, gel code and also the style of, of writing. So we see a decreasing uh, trend in terms of the citation premium as the journal rank increases. And by contrast, if I decompose by journal rank and also by gender, we can see that for male, uh, this is constantly like lower than zero and we, we reach like 20 log points, uh, whatever the, the minus 20 log points, whatever the rank of the journal. For female, we have an upper, uh, an upper trend uh, we have like around uh, 25 log points. But what is very interesting is the decrease as we move to the top rank journal. And this raises a lot of questions like why even female that cite more other female tend to decrease like the, the way they are citing other female, I would say, as the, the, the rank of the journal increases. And I think this, uh, those two graphs raise re really interesting question, uh, either if it is due to the journal or due to, to the author behavior or, I don't know. So this is, this is still a discussion. Uh, so I will um, just end uh, and conclude here. So I have had a result that uh, uh, if this comes up in the discussion, I will be very happy to show. But today, what I want you to, to have in mind is really the 2020 pattern. Like uh, female author tend to 20% uh, more likely to get omitted from the reference compared to paper written by male. And uh, to have the, the same level of citation, they need to be 20 percentile upper in terms of the innovative distribution. Even paper in top five are not excluded. And as I said, I have uh, tried to see if there are uh, some channels, some potential mechanism that I 
going on. And this is tend to not to be explained by uh, the seniority or the lack of information. And finally, there are some policy implications that come from the paper, especially having more female in department and also having more diversity in decisional board. So I, I hope I am in time. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I will be happy to answer any question and comment. Great, thank you. Uh, the discussant is John Gurian. Okay, uh, oh, hold on a second. Let me try to share my screen. All right, well, I'm having some trouble with uh, technical difficulties with sharing my screen, so I'll just go without it. Um, okay, so uh, I was uh, kind of blown away with how much is in this paper. This is a great paper. Um, uh, quick summary. Um, so Marlene uses machine learning and AI text analysis to create these indices that measure both the similarity between papers and how innovative and influential papers are. Um, she then uses those uh, indices to measure gender differences in the rate uh, that female authored and male authored papers are omitted from citations. Um, the findings as she's summarized are that female author papers are more likely to be omitted. Uh, female author papers are less likely to omit other female authored papers. Um, some of the other, there's too many findings to list quickly in five minutes, but some of the other interesting findings that I'm not sure she mentioned was that the gender gap is largest in theory uh, smallest in fields like education and health and, and IO. Uh, the gaps are larger for uh, authors for at, at mid-tier universities. Um, they're larger among uh, more similar papers. So when the sites should be according to the, um, the algorithm more obvious and the, the, the gender gap actually increases uh, among authors who have more top five publications themselves, which I thought was interesting. Uh, I want to talk about three uh, things. Um, one, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the indices themselves. Uh, two, a little bit about um, mechanisms and what the results um, may or may not tell us about why this gender gap exists. And then um, third, uh, just a quick comment on selection. So on the indices, my, my uh, one question I came away from the paper with was, how uh, new and novel the indices themselves are. Um, I, I'm not as familiar with this literature as I should, probably should be, but uh, if, if, the, if the indices are as new and novel as I think they are from reading it, then I think maybe the paper undersells the contribution because the, the indices themselves are uh, fairly incredible tools um, that could be used for all sorts of things. Uh, this paper being one of them, but for, for all sorts of things. Um, and so I, I, I could imagine um, doing more in the paper just to show how accurate they are. So basically a validity exercise. Um, I, I came away wondering how well someone would do if they just automated the choice of their citations as they were writing a paper. Um, how close would that come to something that seems really reasonable? Um, there's there's something at the back of the paper in a in an appendix that sort of shows you know a few kind of famous papers and what the suggested citations are. I thought that was really cool. I would actually put that pretty prominent. I think that's a good way for people to um, get a sense of of the of what the indices do. And then you know just listing like what are the ten most innovative and the ten most influential papers according to the indices, and you know that'll help people get a sense of how um, you know how good these, these are, algorithms are. The other thing is, you know, there's a, there's a whole literature about how there can be, you know, a bias inherent in algorithms themselves. And so it would be interesting to see whether you can do anything to assess whether the algorithms themselves have some inherent bias because they are based in part on a process that has bias in it uh, or not, um, in, in which case that would be a really interesting finding. Um, the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is about what the results might tell us about um, why this gender gap in emissions exists. 
Um, I was actually thinking about the thing that um, that Jen uh, talked about in her paper, and Pat talked a little bit about too. More and uh, you know, so are are women less likely to be invited to give talks? Uh, so their work is less well known, and is that sort of the source of some of this, or not? Or um, uh, I also was wondering a little bit about some form of statistical discrimination, which is where my brain kind of naturally goes. But a lot of the results seem inconsistent with that. Um, some of the results sort of suggest that as more and more information is available, the, the gaps actually get larger. So when people have more top five publications, the gap is larger. The more similarity in the papers or the more obvious the site should be, the gaps are larger. Um, and, uh, you know, what the results, you know, I thought this, the discussion at the end about what the results suggest about um, the role that editors play is really interesting for future um, implications. As far as selection, I thought the paper does a really good job of pointing out that the, you know, the, the inherent discri the discrimination that exists in the publication process itself probably suggests that this is, if anything, an underestimate of the emission um, gap. Um, although there is this analysis that uh, Marlene didn't talk as much about, about uh, estimating the effect of emissions on future productivity, um, which is sort of at the end of the paper. I think for that one, uh, I'd suggest giving a little bit more thought about whether the the uh, the discrimination that's that exists in the omissions also might be causing the um, the gaps in the future productivity as opposed to the emissions themselves. So great job. Great. Thanks so much. Um, uh, our next paper, thanks thanks for that, both of you. Our next paper is called Confidence Men, Gender Differences in Confidence Among Top Economists. And it's by Heather Sarsons and Guo Xu. Uh, okay, great. Um, yeah, so, so thanks so much for uh, uh, including us in this great session. Um, this project is joined with Guo Xu, uh, and we're looking at differences in confidence, mostly uh, among economists. Okay, um, so there's a fairly large literature that's documented a confidence gap between men and women. Um, and this starts at a fairly er early age and persists. So we see that in elementary schools through high schools, girls tend to be much less confident than boys with respect to how well they're doing on especially maths and science exams and courses. Uh, in university, there's evidence that women are less likely to contribute answers to group tasks, uh, even if they're kind of known to be the expert in that topic. Uh, there's experimental evidence that women are less likely to self-promote, potentially because of differences in confidence. And then moving away from the lab, we see in a variety of workplace settings, evidence that women act less confident than men. So for example, um, this one paper is showing that male investors trade about 45% more than women and make uh, much riskier trades, um, which sometimes leads them to kind of underperform. Um, and the authors of this paper um, uh, provide evidence that this is due to differences both in confidence and, and willingness to take risk. So we care about this because it could contribute to gender gaps in wages and promotions. So this is what led to things like uh, the Lean In movement that pushed women to you know, speak up in, in work meetings, ask for promotions, promote themselves and that kind of thing. Um, despite this uh, uh, fairly large literature and kind of uh, public interest in the topic, there's still a lot of open questions as to where and why we see confidence gaps emerge. So for example, is it the case that women who, who break the glass ceiling, who make it to the tops of their careers are more confident or as confident as their male counterparts, which is what we would expect um, if you know, this kind of lean in doctrine is correct. Um, so what we wanna do in this talk is um, just kind of show some preliminary evidence that, uh, to point to directions uh, for research and open questions in this topic. Uh, by, by providing suggestive evidence on where we see heterogeneity and confidence. So, in, for example, are high-performing women less confident than men or are they as confident? Uh, and does the gender gap in confidence vary by setting? Um, at the end of the talk, we'll uh, provide some very preliminary evidence from an experiment looking at why women might be less confident. Um, so, for example, we uh, want to test whether a woman who is very confident 
uh, but gets an answer to a question wrong, loses more credibility than a similar man. Uh, so the main data set we'll use um, for the talk is the initiative of global markets panel, the IGM panel. Um, so this is a survey run out of the University of Chicago that asks uh, well-known economists to give their opinions on economic and policy issues. Um, what we find in these data is that these highly accomplished female economists are less confident than their male counterparts. Uh, and we can shed a little bit of light as to why that is. So we look at whether women are responding to disagreement, so less confident when it's a more controversial topic, um, or whether these differences emerge when they're asked a question outside of their area of expertise. Um, as I mentioned, we'll then show you some very preliminary experiment results, um, looking at how people view individuals who are confident and get a question right or wrong. Okay, so let me start with that. As I mentioned, it's asked prominent economists questions about the economy and policy issues. Um, for their US sample, we have uh, 40 men and 11 women. So just to be very upfront, this is a very selected sample, uh, a small group of people. So we're not making any claims about you know, generalizability, uh, whether this is externally valid or anything. We thought this is just an interesting survey of people who are giving often policy advice or work in um, uh, these kind of advising roles that ask them about their confidence on these different topics. So that's what we're gonna show you. Um, to add a bit more to the sample, we'll also use sometimes the European panel to give us a total of 80, about 80 men uh, and, and 20 women. Um, so in the survey, the respondents are asked how much they agree with a given statement uh, and then how much confidence they have in their answer. So we're gonna look at two primary uh, outcomes that we think kind of uh, represent confidence. So first is one's willingness to give an extreme answer. So to say they either strongly agree or strongly disagree with the statement. And then the second is how much confidence they have in their answer. Uh, we'll supplement the data with uh, informa information from economist CVs, just to look at whether there's certain characteristics that kind of explain these results, like the institution someone is at. Okay, so here's an example of how um, these questions look. Uh, so this is like a, a statement that would be given on immigration and innovation. So out, over the past two years, all else equal, the appeal of the US as a destination for immigrants has changed in ways that will likely decrease innovation in the US economy. Uh, and so here you have uh, responses from two economists. Um, so Robert Hall says he's uncertain, his confidence is five. I don't know what it means to have confidence five in your uncertainty, but, uh, and so then they can give a, a, an explanation for why they gave that, that answer. Um, so here Oliver Hart says he agrees and is, uh, has a confidence level of eight out of 10. So these are the data we're gonna be using. First, this kind of how extreme your answer is and then your confidence level on a scale of one to 10. Okay, so let's, uh, we'll start by showing you just differences in confidence levels between men and women. Um, so the outcomes, as I mentioned, are whether respondent I gives an extreme answer to question J and then uh, respondent I's confidence in their answer for question J. Uh, and we'll put in some individual controls like uh, when they got their PhD, the school they're at and so on. Uh, and then also include question and institution fix effects. Okay, so in columns one and three, here we're just showing you the raw difference in these two measures of confidence. Um, so in column one, the outcome here is uh, an indicator that the individual gave an extreme response, so either strongly agrees or strongly disagrees. Uh, and so you can see that on average, um, about 20% of uh, men are saying that they strongly agree or disagree with the given question. Uh, or sorry, that's 20% of, of male responses. Um, and women are about seven percentage points less likely to give these extreme uh, answers. Um, in terms of confidence, um, you can see that women also are about 0.2 confidence points lower um, on the scale of one to 10 relative to men. Um, we put in a couple of covariates here just to show kind of what correlates with confidence as well. Um, shockingly to everyone, uh, people who get their PhD from Harvard and MIT are really confident, uh, but otherwise we don't see uh, huge differences based on these other characteristics. Okay, um, so when are women less confident than men? The data allows us to look at two possibilities. So first we'll look at whether men and women are reacting differently to questions with more disagreements or more controversial questions. 
Um, there's some evidence from social psychology that women tend to kind of shy away from more controversial, giving their opinion in more controversial topics. Um, then we'll look at differences in confidence when a question is outside of a person's field of expertise. Uh, and we're interested in looking at this because there's some evidence from a really nice paper by Katie Kaufman showing that women are more willing to contribute answers to a group task when the subject is stereotypically female. And then the same for men, they're more willing to put forward their answers when it's a male subject. Um, however, um, she doesn't find differences in willingness to contribute uh, even when participants know they're the expert on a topic or they have kind of the best answer when the topic is typically associated with the opposite sex. So it's not totally clear uh, what we'll see here. Okay, so we look at the first one by just interacting our uh, indicator for the respondent being female with uh, the standard deviation of responses for question J. So um, the higher is this value, kind of the more disagreement there is on uh, that question. Um, for looking uh, outside of the field of expertise, we interact our female indicator with an indicator that respondent I is answering a question outside of his or her field of expertise. Their field is defined from their CV or their publication. So usually people state a primary field or will kind of infer it from where they're publishing. Uh, okay, so here um, we're showing you the relationship between um, kind of disagreement and confidence. Uh, so you can see that the less disagreement there is uh, on a, a question, so the lower is the standard deviation of answers, the more confident both men and women in are in their answer. Uh, and then they both become less confident uh, as the level of disagreement increases uh, and kind of flattens out. So we've put a linear fit here. If you, if you did a um, you know, quadratic fit, you wouldn't see much of a difference. So this could be kind of suggestive, but we're not uh, inferring much from this. Where we do see differences though, is when a question is outside of a person's field of expertise. Um, so here in the first two columns, this is the US sample again. Um, and this is an indicator for a question being asked in a field that's outside of one's primary field. So you can see that both men and women are less confident when asked a question outside of their primary field, but women are even more so. Uh, and when we, when we look at the self-stated confidence outcome, you see that this actually explains the difference in confidence um, between men and women. So if anything, women are even a little bit more confident. That's very noisily estimated though. Uh, in columns three and four, we're just pooling with the European sample. Um, and you can see the exact same thing where people are less confident when asked a question outside of their field of expertise uh, and women even more so. And again, this is explaining the difference in confidence levels between men and women. Um, so one concern might be that um, men work on kind of a broader range of topics, uh, even within their field. Um, and so what we do just as a robustness check is create this variable, um, which is the number of other fields that cite uh, uh, one's papers. Um, so this is meant to pick up whether, for example, someone works on a field like labor, but they get cited a lot by macroeconomists or something like that. And so then if that's more true of men than women, they might feel more confident asking questions about the macroeconomy or something like that. Uh, and we don't find that that takes away at all from this uh, gender gap in confidence. Um, uh, we still see that women are much less confident when answering questions outside of their main field. Okay, so taking stock so far, we see that women are less likely to give an extreme answer and are less confident in their answers. Uh, this is driven by differences in confidence answering questions outside of one's primary field. Um, we think there's a, a host of further questions of which we're going to kind of speculate about now. Um, so specifically, we were uh, curious of whether the confidence gap that we see just generally even outside of the sample is an equilibrium outcome. So for example, it, are women penalized more than men if they state that they're very confident about something and then end up being wrong about that? Or it could be that women are more sensitive to being wrong and so will shade their confidence. So it could be kind of a demand or supply side story. Uh, so I'll just show you very uh, uh, preliminary early evidence from a short Antarctic experiment. Uh, so this was an audit style study that we did where participants uh, recruited from MTurk were asked to evaluate professional forecasters. 
So we took public data from a Fed on forecasters' predictions of GDP growth. Uh, this was in, uh, in 2017. And then we gave people the, the participants information on that person's confidence and gender. So essentially what they would see is, you know, Heather predicts GDP growth to be 2%. Uh, and then we used kind of the, the confidence intervals that people had to say kind of how confident they are in that prediction uh, on a scale of one to uh, five. Uh, and so then after the participants would see a forecaster's prediction, they see the actual GDP growth for 2017. Uh, we asked them how credible they find the forecaster and whether they would recommend this person be consulted in the future. This was not incentivized. So again, uh, uh, very early stage. Uh, but what we want to do is look at how the decision to recommend varies with um, first, whether the forecaster was correct, and two, the forecaster's confidence in their answer. So we want to test whether a man and a woman who give the same correct or incorrect answer and who are equally confident, um, does the participant uh, rate them differently? Okay, so this is showing people who got kind of the correct answer, so we're, who, who were within kind of a narrow band of uh, correctly predicting GDP growth. Uh, and then their confidence is along the x-axis. And you can see that for both men and women, uh, uh, they're kind of equally likely to be highly recommended, especially if they're more confident. Uh, women are maybe a little bit less likely than men. When we look at incorrect answers, um, we see that both men and women, again, are less likely to be recommended, but you see kind of a gap opening up uh, for men and women who are very confident in their answer. So women who are, who are more confident uh, are, but get the answer wrong are less likely to be recommended by the participant relative to, to male forecasters. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, we see a confidence gap existing among top economists, but only when asked questions outside of their field of expertise. Uh, we have uh, preliminary suggested evidence that women may lose more credibility if they are confident about an answer but wrong. Um, and so we think this is kind of important to think about because, you know, for the case of economics, for example, if people are giving policy recommendations and there is a difference in confidence, this could lead to differences in kind of who, who is listened to and that kind of thing. So we think there's some interesting questions uh, kind of open for research. So first looking more into the evidence on whether women are actually penalized for being confident, and then also looking at whether information is lost because women um, are or act less confident than men. So for example, are their ideas less likely to be listened to? Uh, so I'll leave it there and uh, thanks so much for having us. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, so the discussant is Jenna Stearns. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, thanks, Heather. This is a really interesting uh, paper. Um, Let's we'll start by very quickly kind of summarizing uh, what they found. Um, this paper shows that top female economists at U.S. universities are less confident than their male counterparts when responding to survey questions about uh, the economy and public policy. Um, in the paper, they kind of look at three outcomes. Um, the first is whether uh, there's a difference in the probability of responding to a question at all. And then conditional and answering, they find that women are less likely to give extreme answers um, and they're less like, confident in the accuracy of their answers. Um, a lot of my comments are actually gonna focus on this first uh, point that women are less likely to answer these questions altogether, which Heather didn't discuss in her presentation, but I think is um, important to think a little bit more about. Uh, this paper is really uh, nice in that it can at least provide some early suggestive evidence of the mechanisms driving this result. And they find that their results are driven almost entirely by women being less confident uh, only outside of their main field of expertise. And I think this is really important when thinking about the implications of uh, these confidence differences, not only when thinking about kind of uh, trust in terms of policy responses for these top women, but also thinking about the importance of confidence in the economics pipeline more generally. So confidence has been proposed as a potential reason for some of the gender gaps in academic economics. 
uh, why women are less likely to publish well, to get tenure, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of reasons you could think confidence would matter. For example, um, if women are less confident, they may be less likely to self-promote their work. Um, they might be less likely to uh, sell their results when writing papers. They might be less likely to submit to, to riskier journals and all of these things can have implications on tenure. Um, if this is really driven by, um, you know, something outside of, of a direct field of expertise, you might think that uh, the implications would be very different on some of these margins in ways that would, would, would really matter. Um, so I just have a couple of main comments I'll, I'll talk briefly about. As Heather said, you know, I think one of the the big limitations and their ability to push further in some dimensions is there's a, a fairly limited sample size. Um, but what's really nice is they have this other European sample that kind of validates the results. Um, still though, I think to the extent that it's possible, it might be worthwhile to add some more years of data and increase the number of women um, or economists in general a little bit. But one thing you could do even without that, I think that would, would uh, provide a little bit of credibility maybe, would be to just do a robustness check where you replicate essentially the main results a bunch of times dropping one person or, or one woman each time. And hopefully you would see that the results are not driven by a particular person um, and that you see fairly consistent results um, in these different samples, leave one out samples. Um, as I said, a lot of my, my comments are going to go back to this, uh, this um, difference in the likelihood of providing an answer to the questions. Um, so I wanted to just know a little bit about how respondents are supposed to participate in this survey. Are they supposed to answer all questions? Um, are they told they can opt out if they um, don't have a strong opinion? Is there some sort of incentive to respond? Um, and then kind of outside of that, I think there's a lot of scope to push a little bit harder on are participants more likely to respond to certain types of questions. So are, for example, they more likely to respond to questions in their field? Um, are they more likely to respond to questions where there's a higher consensus, either um, in terms of the, the variance in the overall rating or a higher average level of confidence? And this is somewhat similar to the analysis Heather showed um, by this. And then is there a gender difference in these things? And I think this is potentially important because if there is, um, you could potentially rule out some alternative explanations that are proposed in the paper for this difference in the likelihood of providing an answer. For example, women just have less time to participate in this survey overall. Um, you also might be able to get a little bit of insight into um, who or when there's a comment provided or the use of the, the no opinion option versus a complete non-response. Um, and then I'm, I think, almost out of time, but just very quickly, um, I wanted to just think a little bit about how um, you know, potential uncertainty affecting the likelihood of non-response would affect the interpretation of the later results that Heather showed. Um, because I think this is, again, important for the interpretation. Heather in the paper is very clear that the, the results are conditional on providing a response, but I just wanted to, to kind of quickly run a, a thought experiment about um, what if people don't respond because they're not confident in their answer. So I just very quickly simulated some data. Um, in the first three columns, I estimated the main results from the paper, just instead of looking at gender, looking at if you got your PhD at Harvard or MIT. And Heather finds that um, people from Harvard and MIT are much more confident in their responses overall. But then I said, okay, well, what if uh, this, you know, not responding indicates that you're actually very unconfident in your answer. And we just impute those missing values with a, a relatively lower than average level of confidence. Unsurprisingly, we can uh, attenuate this effect quite a bit. And then finally, in the last column, I said, well, what actually, if what happens if there's actually a difference in uh, the signal that you provide by where you got your PhD? And this, of course, would be similar by gender. We can actually completely erase the results. So, um, you know, this is a simulation. 
you know, these assumptions don't have to be true. But I just wanted to point out, I think you might push a little bit harder on, on trying to figure out what um, not responding is signaling, because that can potentially really impact how we should interpret uh, what these what these results actually mean. So um, I think I'm out of time. So uh, it's a great paper. Thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to discuss it. Great, thanks so much. Um, uh, so the next paper is a longitudinal look at gender gaps in the salaries of economists at US public institutions. And the authors are Kelly Bedard, Max Lee, and Heather Royer. Okay, can you see the screen okay? Yep. Yeah. All right, cool. So I'll begin then. Um, hi, everyone. I'm um, Max Lee, and I'll be presenting a joint work with Kelly Bedard and Heather Ruyer. Um, in this presentation, we're going to do essentially exactly what the title says. In this paper, we're going to study the gender pay gaps for economists at public institutions in the US. And to do that, we collected a longitudinal data of um, salaries for academic economists from the last two decades to understand where and how the gender gaps arise in the profession. The motivation for this paper comes from the concerns about gender disparity in the profession. Since you know, the AA survey on professional climate, there has been discussions on whether the climate is less supportive towards women compared to men. And we see the reflections of that in a, the proportion of women in the profession, invitation to seminars, question asked during the seminars, publication, citation, and tenure. And most of this can affect salaries that women receive in economics. So in this paper, we're interested in the gender pay gap as another way to um, think about how gender disparity affects women in the profession. And there are already a broad literature that documented gender pay gap in the last 30 years. Here, we're going to focus specifically on gender gaps estimated for economics profession. According to the existing literature that we have listed here, there is little evidence that there are gender differences in pay for early career economists. And most of the evidence suggests that um, gender disparity in pay come from um, economists later in their careers. However, um, most of Oops. Most of the previous paper in the literature seem to use cross-sectional snapshots, often suffer from a um, small number of women in their sample, and evidence that we have are mostly dated. And even if we only look at the very recent data, re results tend to be mixed and there are no clear consensus. So in this paper, we're going to generate comprehensive longitudinal data of salaries of all tenure track or tenured economists who worked at top public universities in the US from 2005 spanning all the way to um, most recent available data as late as 2019. This allows us to look at how economy salaries change between um, entry, uh, post tenure, and also for longer length of experience beyond um, 20 years since earning their PhDs. Importantly, we can do this by comparing economists to receive their PhDs around the same time period. So this means that we can see the dynamics of how the gender pay gap changes for a particular set of cohorts and see whether these gender gaps are driven by generational differences between early career and later career economists in our sample, or if there are actual divergences in salaries by gender as people progress in their career. Um, not only that, but we can also look at job mobility as well as promotion decisions to think about potential reasons why these gender gaps might appear. Um, to do this, we assembled a data of salaries among academic economists and uh, gathered in additional information to augment uh, what we have in salaries. So for the salaries, we take the listing of top 50 uh, US-based economics programs from the 2017 US News and World Report um, listings and uh, choose all the public schools in that uh, list. Plus, um, we add in all University of California campuses except for UC Merced. 
uh, for UCs, the University of California campuses, we collected the salaries that were made publicly available online at um, UC Office of President website. So that's public. Anyone can go and take a look at the salaries for any UC employee from 2010 to 2019. And for non-UC institutions in the list, we made FOIA requests for salaries starting from 2005, spanning to the most recent available data, um, which tend to be around 2018 or 2019. We received salaries for different years from each institution, so the length of data set kind of varies a bit by school, but for most part, we have data for 2005 to 2018. And we link the salary data that we collect to a series of other variables. We gather gender using identifiable information like pronouns or photos. We gather PhD year and institution, which are important because you want to know how much experience people have in each of our salary observations. We also collected individuals' job histories. So even if we don't have salaries for people who moved out of our data, we still have some information about where they moved to. And lastly, we gathered information on their field of specialization because field might influence the salaries that people receive. Um, here, I would like to describe the data in the slide. So about 17% of our uh, salary sample were women and women tend to be observed earlier in their career in our data. So that's not really a surprise, but nearly half of all women in our data had 10 years or um, less in experience since earning PhD. Whereas for men, we see that over half of them had um, 20 years or more experience. This means that we might expect to see higher salaries for men just because you know they are uh, likely to be higher ranked. And that's exactly what we see here where men on average uh, earned about $30,000 more compared to women. Um, in the descriptive statistics. Overall, we have about 254 women and 1,100 men in our sample. Okay, so um, now let's move into empirical analysis. As I mentioned earlier, we estimate the gender pay gap separately by the years since PhD. In particular, we divided up the sample to three different categories. The observations within the first nine years since earning PhD, 10 to 19 years since PhD and 20 plus years since PhD. We interact these indicators, the, the uh, superscripts, with the gender variable to estimate the gender pay gap separately by experience. But because we only have around 15 years of data for um, maximum for each person, and we can't see the same person at year zero and year 20, um, the years since PhD would also be affected by the generational change in addition to um, the experience. And we're going to discuss that further when we get to the longitudinal an analysis part of this um, talk. Um, also, another thing that I would like to stress here is that we are not controlling for productivity measures like publication or citation. Um, we are going to talk about that a little bit more at the end of the presentation also. Um, we run this particular model uh, with different controls in each column in this table and report the point estimates for the interaction terms that represent the gender pay gap um, in uh, economists, uh, people in economics profession. So going from left to right, we move from least controlled to the most controlled model where all regression models include current year fixed effect, PhD year fixed effect, year since PhD fixed effects. So for those with the least amount of experience in the profession, we see that women are paid about 4.5% lower sellers than men in the first column. And that gap decreases to 2.8% when we also take into account um, individuals, PhD institution and the field. So overall it appears that even at the entry level, there are some disparity in sellers by gender. However, this gender pay gap disappears in columns three and four when we also take into account um, things like the ranking of the current institution or the current institution fixed effect, which implies that the most of the gender gap during the early career in the last 20 years are arising due to the disparity in types of institution that women and men are placing at, at the beginning of their careers. Next, if we look at the second row, um, we have more uh, people with more years in the profession. We see larger gender pay gap, no matter what kind of controls we use. Importantly, the gender pay gap persists 
within each department for observations made 10 to 19 years after PhD. Although here the ranking of the school still seems to matter quite a bit in gender gaps if we compare, say, the first two columns and third and fourth columns. For 20 plus years after PhD group, we can't explain any of the gender gap using the school rank. So overall, for early career economists, the gender gap is really driven by the age of placement, but as career progresses, more of that gender gap seems to come from women earning less than men in the same department. And this rise in the gender gap in pay seemed to occur sometime between 10 and 19 years since um, earning PhD, which would be after the tenure clock at the initial institution runs out. So how can we explain this change in the gender gap um, between early career and later on? One potential explanation could be that the gender gap is driven by generational differences in how women and men are paid in the profession. However, we know that there are gender disparities in things like you know, seminar presentation, publication, citation, and tenure. So it could also be explained by gender experience in tenure and promotion. Alternatively, it could also be due to differences in job mobility post-tenure. So we're going to address this uh, question using the longitudinal structure of our data. What we'll do is we'll target specific time span in economist careers. First, we'll limit the sample of, um, to individuals who are in our sample on the fifth year since PhD. So these are the people who are in our sample on year five. So following them through year five to nine, it will give us an idea on how salaries and job mobility patterns might change during the tenure review uh, process. Then we're going to run similar estimations for cohort 11, which are the people who are in their 11th year since um, PhD. So these are most likely people who already received their tenure and we follow them from year 11 to 15 to assess the dynamics of salary changes through things like promotion and outside offers. So overall, this set of analysis will let us see whether you know, there are reasons to believe that salary gaps differ by experience for um, reasons outside of uh, generational differences between early career and later career economists in our sample. So let's first take a look at uh, court five. Women in this group are less likely to stay at their year five institution by year eight after a tenure clock has presumably run out. Although the differences here aren't statistically significant, there is some evidence here that women are either less likely to be tenured at their year five institution or move before um, tenure review. We can also observe kind of something similar when we look at the promotion to associate professor. So here we condition on the individuals staying in our sample. So basically among people who get their tenure at the year five institution, women are slower than men in the promotion to associate level. And this implies that it's possible that women face more delays in promotion. Um, and lastly, if we look at the salary gap, we got this U-shaped uh, curve where salary gap increases um, in the beginning and then it decreases. And the shape could be for two different reasons. One, it could be that women face delays in promotion to associate level. So we'll see um, salary gap earlier, but it largely goes away as women catch up on the promotion. And another reason is that women with lower salaries are more likely to exit from the sample if we look at um, the data more carefully. Uh, and that could be because they didn't get tenure at their year five institution. So then we would expect the salary gap to disappear um, for both of these uh, potential reasons. And ultimately, among people who got their tenure in year five institution, it appears that there is no gender pay gap immediately after a tenure decision is made if we look at the year eight and year nine in this graph. For um, the court 11, we don't have evidence that men are more likely to move than women um, post tenure. So it's unclear whether the outside options are moving um, or like moving to another school is major driver of the gender gap arising in year 10 through 19, at least according to our data that we have here. However, what we see is we see large disparity in the likelihood of getting promoted to full professor between women and men. Here, women lag majorly behind in promotion 
and this difference is that's statistically significant. And if we look at the gender um, gap in salaries for this group, we again see fluctuations over time, but the trend appears to suggest that the gender gap increases as women advance in their career, most likely due to the disparity in the timing of promotion to full professor between women and men that we just saw in the last slide. So overall, um, gender disparity in our, in our profession in economics um, is an important issue, obviously, this goes widely, and we are contributing to this literature by constructing a large longitudinal up-to-date data that allows to not only measure the gender gaps in salaries, but also follow individuals um, in particular courts to investigate potential reasons why these gender gaps might arise. Uh, we find negligible gender gap in early career, but this gap seem to grow later in the career, similar to some of the previous findings in the literature. And we take the advantage of the longitudinal structure of our data to find some evidence that salary gaps might arise because a woman are less likely than men to get tenured and face delays in the promotion compared to men. And for future work, we're looking to incorporate productivity measures as well as job histories, which we didn't take into account in this paper. And in doing so, we're going to um, try to construct a full mapping of the gender disparity in salaries, job mobility, and returns to productivity and how all of those things work together. Um, I look forward to the questions and discussion. Um, thank you. Ah, thank you so much. Um... So our discussant is Donna Ginzer. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so thank you. Uh, this was a very interesting paper and um, I have several comments on it. Uh, first of all, this paper represented a lot of work. They collected salary data from top 50 economics programs at public universities in some cases going from 1997 to 2018. Uh, their findings are very important. They find that more women are more likely to leave their five-year and 11-year institutions than men. The gender salary gap grows over time, uh, which uh, is very provocative. Um, it's about 0.01, uh, less than 10 years, and it's not significant. It's uh, about 3.4 uh, log points at 10 to 19 years. And it's about 12 log points at 20 plus years. So things get worse over time. Uh, so I have several comments. Uh, first of all, it's important to be careful with the salary data. If I look up my publicly reported salary, it includes uh, three months of grant funding and that could contaminate your salary results. Uh, the fix of course is to control for federal grants and look at salary profiles in years with and without grant funding. A second consideration with salary is whether or not any of the institutions are unionized. A second caution is to be careful with CV data. I know that you're not really using the CV data here, but you will be in the future. Um, CVs could be dated uh, and they may list papers that are not really peer reviewed. Uh, our experience with matching publications to individuals using the CMET data suggests that there are problems even with accuracy in terms of reporting publications. So you may want to consider using Web of Science or EconLit. Um, there are several related publications that I think you should take a look at. Uh, there's a working paper now by Taylor, Cortez, and Hearn, uh, Publication Compensation and the Public Affairs Discount. They did very much the same thing you did by looking at economics papers and public affairs uh, salaries. So I would uh, suggest taking a close look at that. I published a paper in 2004 in AWIS magazine about why women earn less. And the reason I'm mentioning this kind of obscure article is that I found very much the same thing across academia, a very narrow gender salary gap uh, at assistant professor level a growing gap at the associate professor level and a huge gap at the full professor level using decade, uh, data from a decade ago. So uh, this uh, finding of a growing gap has been seen in the data. This Carlin et al. paper in the Southern Economics Journal finds that women are rewarded less for their productivity. And this is uh, an issue that I think you should consider in your nest work. And uh, 
my paper with uh, Steve C.C. Uh, Shu Khan and Wendy Williams also looked at the gap in economics by pay uh, through 2010. Uh, we show a growing gap again, and um, that gap is not as apparent in other fields. So economics is different, and I think that's important to mention. Uh, in terms of thoughts for future work, this is largely, uh, this is obviously a start of a larger re research effort. Um, so of course, control for publications and other bibliometric measures. In uh, some prior work, I found that the sum of the journal impact factors was more predictive than citations. So you may wanna think about that as you look at controls for publications. Um, Academic Analytics is a private company that collects publications, grants, and awards for top research in institutions in the United States. They've done a lot of the work for you already, and you may want to consider merging your salary data onto that, or at least using accessing those data to compare your measures of publications and grants. Um, you stressed in your presentation the importance of where people are located in terms of uh, their academic institution. Uh, Shu Khan and I will be presenting a paper tomorrow that shows that we there's not really a gender promotion gap at research intensive universities after you control for publications and citations. But if you look at less research intensive universities, the gap is about 45%, which is just incredible. Uh, and so the question I have for you to consider, is this true of salaries as well? Are you seeing a larger gen uh, gender gap at lesser ranked institutions, such as the promotion gap um, that we found? And since you're based in California, you could take a look at the Cal State uh, system data, for example. Um, Further thoughts, Carlin, uh, Heather Sarson's work, uh, David Card's work has found that women's research accomplishments have been treated differently than men's. And I encourage you to see what your data has to say about that. Is the return to a five, top five publication different for men or women? Um, the, the million dollar question is why does the return on experience differ so much for men and women? Um, we know that universities are, act like monopsonists, and this should be considered in any salary discussion. And you may also want to use large salary adjustments as a proxy for outside offers. I don't know if they're still collecting these data, but during your time period, the University of Arkansas did a salary survey about starting salaries. If you could see uh, somebody's salary in year N, and then in year N plus one, it's right around the same level as that salary survey says for that rank. That's a pretty good indication that they got an outside offer, and that outside offer uh, increased their salary increment. So these are all potential explanations, but really looking at why the return on experience penalizes women as we get older, I think is, to me, the most important one to consider. So thank you for a very interesting and provocative paper, and I look forward to seeing uh, additional work based on these data in the future. Great, thanks so much. Okay, well, we have a little bit of time for discussion of those all very optimistic and uplifting um, research papers. Um, so um, I really enjoyed uh, hearing all of these uh, discussions, though, of course, um, maybe I didn't always like some of the findings. Um, uh, since like most many people here, I'm in several of those data sets. Um, so before we, um, people who have questions can go ahead and put them right into the Q&A, but I would also like to just um, see if because of the Q&A, any of our authors would like to jump in and clarify something, reply to something, um, oh, thank you, um, or um, otherwise, you know, make some comments about uh, questions that have come up in the chat. Okay, you were so efficient uh, at answering the questions in the chat, and I don't see new questions coming into the chat, so I will just ask uh, a couple of questions. Um, 
I was curious about um, whether um, each of the authors, uh, maybe especially since people squeeze themselves a little bit at the end, um, want to say something about what do they think if they are willing to be confident in making a kind of policy declaration or proposal, is there one that we should draw um, from your research? So I'll do that. I'll, uh, I can take those in order. Jen, you, you, yours might be uh, the easiest to answer that question. Yeah, so I'm, um, you know, as, as, as Pat mentioned, this is definitely part of the larger project uh, that we're starting. I'm very interested in looking at what the causal impacts of um, potentially changing who departments invite um, as seminar speakers, what, what the impacts of that could be on the speakers and on the, the home department, maybe the students there, or the junior faculty. Um, you know, I think I get a lot of pushback about when I talk about this, about whether we should just be, you know, targeting the, the number of the, the current composition of the profession. And I, I, part of the reason I've become so interested in seminars is I think this is perhaps the easiest lever to play with if we want to shift the equilibrium. So if we are unhappy with the current composition of the economics profession, we have to change something. And people think about, you know, we should be hiring more women, hiring my, more minorities. Yes, we should, but we at the, you know, at any current moment, we have a given pool uh, and that's tough to, and it's a bit of a zero sum game. Um, but we could all be inviting more women and minorities through our departments um, to broaden networks, break down some silos, um, you know, try to try to um, uh, address these disparities through that channel. And I expect it will have big returns um, on the other metrics that we're watching. So these are empirical questions. I hope to answer some of them in the future, but um, that's my, my hunch as sort of a policy prescription. I was going to say, I imagine you sometimes get the comment that uh, your data is, of course, seminars accepted as opposed to seminars um, mm -hmm. seminars invited. And I don't know if you yeah. wanted to just comment on that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So there is, um, uh, I do hear this a lot that, you know, some departments try very hard to invite women, but they just turn them down more often because they don't want to travel. Um, I don't know that, you know, that is something that's difficult. We can't see it in the data without doing some sort of massive survey. And I'm not sure how good the response rate would be or whatever. We're obviously only looking at the actual uh, seminars that are given. So I think, you know, maybe I suppose there's anecdotal evidence on one side. I certainly have heard plenty of anecdotal evidence on the other side that women, especially with young children, aren't invited because people think they will say no. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that we think these role model effects matter and all this stuff matters, I guess I would push departments to just try harder, just invite, invite more. If the, if the yield is lower, just um, try a little harder. I don't think, I don't think that is the primary reason that we're seeing the gaps that we see. Uh, let me also comment, you mentioned in the chat that uh, you'll be looking at the Zoom era and the Zoom era may change availability um, of economists to, to, in different in, in different ways, so who knows? Definitely, yeah, we're continuing to collect data, so um, stay tuned. Okay, great. Um, Marlon, did you um, want to say anything about a sort of policy implication or outcome from your paper um, or, or where you're going to go next with this? I saw there was a lot of excitement in the chat about different things you could do with these tools, not necessarily even uh, related to the question at hand, but I don't, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I think that two, there are two key things that uh, kind of give hopes for the future. Uh, the first one is the fact that uh, having like more female in, in institution tend to reduce the omission gap. So I found, actually I found that um, female benefit less from being in the same institution compared to male, but at least there is a reduction compared to the, uh, to the mean level, I would say. And the second thing comes from the, like it, it, it seems like it's more than the share of female that is in action here, but uh, it's the, what female represent or the perception that people have from female uh, that matter. Because with the, 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 the exercise of looking at the, if the switch of the gender tend to impact, uh, the gender of the editor tend to influence like the, the citation pattern or the omission pattern, I found that there is a kind of, a kind of an effect uh, of uh, depending on the gender of the, the editor. 
So basically, like having more diversity at uh, the, the, the gatekeeper, at the decisional board, seems to be something that could uh, impact and or influence the, the omission pattern and also bring women to have like more citation, I would say, compared to female. And the uh, I mean, last thing that I would like to say maybe is if I, um, if I put this, my paper in line with other research, actually, there is a thing where it, it seems like people a uh, female will face a double, uh, I mean, how I can quote it, like there is a, a double thing going on here because other people show that the people, female have to have more citation to, to get published or even to, yes, conditional on the quality. And I found that even that, they, they fail to capture as much citation that, as they should. So the, it seems like there is two things going on here that contribute to to penalize women basically so yeah so i think with those two um, policy implication policy side suggestions this could have a, a great impact on what we see for female great thanks so heather i saw that you fielded a question in the chat about um are men too confident or women underconfident um so i don't know if you have thoughts about implications from your work or both um, yeah, we, we tried to, um, we thought about trying to get at this by looking at questions or statements that ended up having kind of a clear right or wrong answer later on. I think because of the nature of the questions that are, there aren't many like that, they're pretty uh, subjective. So we're not able to say much about whether men are overconfident or women are underconfident. Um, that's potentially something that could be tested in, in an experimental setting. Um, but I, I think you know the important thing is if people do listen to someone or give more kind of credence to someone who who's very confident, um, then there's maybe a case for for trying to equalize confidence levels uh, across mm -hmm. gender. Interesting. Uh, so I actually am on the IGM panel, so I am one of the women in your data set, and I do sometimes forget to answer the question, and now feel really badly that uh, someone's tracking me on that. Um, so I'll, I'm going to be more diligent uh, going forward in the future. Um, I'll also say, by the way, you asked the question, you quickly mentioned at the beginning, what does it mean to be uncertain with then a high, like answer uncertain and then a high level of certainty? I don't know what other people do with that. The, the, the description isn't completely clear, but I always use, I actually do that a lot. Uh, and I do that when I think I am certain that economics, when I feel very strongly that economics has not yet provided us a strong answer to the question. So I'll say I'm very certain it's uncertain, but I don't know if that's common. Um, great. Uh, and then uh, Kelly, Max, uh, Heather, do you guys want to um, comment? I see there was a question in the chat here about um, whether uh, you think this is representative for private universities and whether we think at all these um, effects are changing over time. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or uh, wanna comment on it or um, other policy so, implications. Yeah, go ahead. Right, so I'll start with the policy implications, I guess. So I think in terms of our paper, it's on, Perhaps how it's related to policy isn't very prescriptive in the sense that we're trying to figure out where these gender gaps are coming from in salaries and if we could figure out um, what are the contributors and what are the big contributors in particular to the gender, um, gender gap in salaries, then it, we could um, say something about um, which uh, method of um, reducing gender gaps in the future would be more effective compared to others. Um, so I think that's something that could be related to the policy. In terms of um, the question about the uh, private universities, um, I think we would have to be uh, a bit agnostic about uh, private universities because we don't have really data to think about how they compare with the public universities. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if there is a more that I can say about that without um, having uh, more comprehensive data on both public and private universities. Great. But we do see um, job mobility, so we can um, look at where people move to and how that might affect uh, uh, future salaries. Great. 
less career progresses for women and men. <clears throat> Great. Um, I don't know if either, any of the authors or discussants want to jump in on anything else that's come up in the chat while, uh, while we were talking here. Under a couple of people have asked about, um, you know, noting that COVID is a good natural experiment for uh, reducing travel costs for women. It also obviously has independently increased <laughs> the pressure on women with, with small kids. Um, it also, I think the thing that people are more worried about, uh, or at least that I see people talking about on Twitter, is the extent to which it could enhance a superstar effect. You know, basically it's with no travel, it increases the availability of stars. And so to what extent is Raj Chetty giving all the talks now? Um, because he doesn't have to go anywhere. And so empirical questions, we'll have the data eventually. Great, great, thanks. All right, um, I think if I don't see any other questions um, uh, that anybody uh, wants to jump in on, you can check the chat for a second. We will um, perhaps close a minute early. Uh, anybody else? Pat, you look like you wanna say something, no? Okay. Great. Okay. Well, let me thank everyone for this, um, what I think was a really interesting session. We saw a lot of four really interesting and uh, important papers. I want to thank the authors. I want to thank the discussants. The, being a discussant can sometimes be thankless. So let me particularly thank the discussants for their um, preparation for this seminar and for um, taking the time to discuss these papers. Um, and I will close it there. Thanks so much, everybody.